On January 25, 1988, members of the Sheet Metal Workers International Association and their union contractors dedicated this exhibit to celebrate 100 years of solidarity and craftsmanship and to increase public awareness of their contributions to this industry. We experience the benefits of the sheet metal journeyman's craft every day of our lives. Yet we're seldom aware of it, for it's often hidden behind walls or ceilings or floors. Craftsmanship, crossing the line into artistry, as sheet metal worker becomes sculptor. This sheet metal monument is a testament to the skill and commitment of the Union Sheet Metal Workers, all volunteers who came here to build it. And it is a celebration of the artisans who, for a century, have shaped steel, copper, aluminum, and brass in helping to build the North American continent. And here, at last, for all to see, are the achievements of the men and women who shape metal with their hands. The symmetry, the precision, the practicality, and the beauty. The artisans themselves demonstrate their work here. Work that has been passed from one generation to the next in the spirit of skill and excellence. But first, there was only the idea, and fittingly, they planned the idea's realization at Carlo Plaza, home of the National Training Fund. All of this is skin, laminated, uh, stainless steel. Some of the buildings will be copper. There will be brass involved, various types of stainless steel. It's all laminated to 5 8 inch plywood. That's the skins that, that come up on the perimeter of the building and the roofs of the building. Now, get back to the plant. You can see there's nothing simple about it. Everything is on the oblique. Nothing is straight. The uh, project, indeed, would be a challenge. Architect Frank Geary's dream would demand skill of the heart as well as the hands. His was a bold plan, a monument not to be lost amid the renewed grandeur of the old pension building, now the National Building Museum. Perhaps curator David Chase put it best. This space is so big and so overwhelming that it can just gobble things up. And I wanted somebody who could say, look, for nine months, I'm going to have something in there that that great hall doesn't overwhelm. I'm going to design what, in essence, is a, a celebratory piece, kind of a birthday cake uh, for the 100th anniversary of the Sheet Metal Workers. It's going to stand out just the way a birthday cake ought to. That is going to blaze in that space. Gary could do that. Uh, we knew we were working with the best sheet metal people in the industry, and we wanted to give them a challenge. So <laughs> in looking at the design of the building, um, we were really looking at the sculptural forms and how it would work with what they're looking for as far as fitting within the space here. But we knew they were good, and we knew they could do anything that we gave them. To build this monument to their craft, Union Sheet Metal workers volunteered their time and their skill. But all across the continent, Union Sheet Metal contractors also were swept up by the work at hand. Many donated materials for the structure. Others offered their shops for prefabrication of large pieces to be shipped intact and later placed in some predetermined niche. This one exhibit uh, kind of highlights or accentuates what custom architectural metal or custom sheet metal is all about that it can be shaped into any, about any kind of thing you, you want to shape it into. 
even if you can't quite describe what you're seeing. What you're seeing is the beginning of an idea. Within days, its framework was up, looking skeletal in the hundred-year-old hall. But a living thing must have bones on which to hang muscle and skin. Sheet metal journeymen, trained in a skill, begin to see their work here as something more. We're not building a square box here. We're building a, a piece of art. The, the angles and the boxes of projections that you see coming off of it are quite a bit different from any normal job. And the angles, they shot it, uh, some of them when we laid it out, they was 89.5 degrees or 99.5 degrees. Everything was laid off to a degrees with the laser beam. Uh, everything has to be just so-so to make the end product come out looking right. What, what they're doing here is, it's, I mean, it's something that you, we never do in construction. So uh, a guy that's a good cheap metal worker, a good journeyman, uh, the ideas will come by itself because it's still, it's still like a, it's our trade, right? So uh, the guy that's got a, you know, that's got a, a good head, well, he can build whatever you want to in sheet metal as long as he puts his uh, mind to it. Meanwhile, like alchemists changing base metal to gold, craftsmen gave new life to old artifacts which would grace the interior of the exhibit. My understanding is that this is a part of a facade off of a, a building in, uh, out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And now it's being renovated uh, by myself, a little help here and there. This will be among many artifacts that have been gathered from around the country. This gives a typical example. This one is at least 150 years old. The metal is rather fatigued, very difficult to solder because it's been rusty for many years. But it's a matter of removing the old rust, and taking the, the um, fancy leaves off, and then re-soldering, tinning we call it, tinning the backside, tinning the front side, and knowing what kind of acid to mix because you can't really buy acid this day that works like good old fashioned cut acid, which I made last night. And uh, it obviously has worked very good. So re-soldering this all back together. And in the main, make it presentable. We don't want to take the old look away from it because it is old. So we don't want it look, to look like something that we just made new, but we want it to be beautiful and be presentable. So. That's what this one piece is all about, rebuilding it. The pieces came in from everywhere, in every condition. Often dented and dulled by time, they chronicled the sheet metal craft as it evolved over centuries. And the artisan's handiwork ranged from the commonplace to the intricate and the bizarre. The museum's lights burned later as the days wore on. Apprentices, having worked their normal shifts elsewhere, came by night for another four or six hours' work. Journeymen, here from every region of the continent, had one thing in common, the union training program, which standardized their skills and enabled them to work together. There was a single-mindedness to the project. Still, union brothers and sisters did not neglect the season of brotherhood which was upon them. They celebrated with a Christmas tree, and side by side, an American and Canadian flag. I was really proud to put that flag beside the uh, American flag because it really uh, it did something to me that uh, I'll remember the rest of my life. Because if you see, see you see this here? This, is, this says two flags, one union, and this is right. The spirit of cooperation proved irresistible even to members of other unions, like these electricians who pitched in and helped. We're the, uh, from Local 26, and we're down helping out Local 100 on their exhibit here and uh, wiring up some lights and plugs for them just to kind of make this thing work. So as a brother, you know, as brothers, helping them out. A, a union member will volunteer his time because he realizes how important it is that we stick together and to work as a team. Together is the only way we can accomplish anything. Now, that roof is not only cut on an angle, as word spread of this phenomenon taking place at the building museum, visitors began dropping by. One in particular had a very personal stake in the work being done. How you doing? Hey, Carla, 
Good to see you. Nice to meet you. John Pace. John Edgar. Where are you? From California. <laughs> Hi. Sure. What parts? Orange County. 420? Yes. I'm from Peoria, Illinois, local one. Rupert Walworth, I'm from Seattle, Washington. Mike Young, Kansas City. John Wasnick, Sarasota, Florida. Atlanta, Georgia. New York. Vancouver, BC. Victoria, BC. Washington, DC. But for these workers, it was becoming a race against time. Due to scheduling conflicts at the museum, work could begin on the structure only six weeks before its opening. And the task itself was becoming more difficult. There could be no cranes inside the museum. So large pieces had to be wrestled through the doors, then hefted into place using rigging ropes and scissor lifts. Workers at times hung from the ropes like mountain climbers. The structure had no foundation. It was freestanding. So the work was becoming more delicate as well. But the challenge of it all seemed to bring out the best in these sheet metal workers. Till now, much of their craft had been hidden behind walls or ceilings or floors. But when this job was done, their work would be there for all to see. The polished copper, brass, and steel would bear witness to their skill. Uh, the entire structure all had to be calculated using trigonometry and all of the lengths of the members had to be calculated using trigonometry. Uh, that's rather unusual in the construction business because we normally don't work with all of these odd type angles. I think this whole project uh, exemplifies the, the slogan we've been using for the past year, uh, Together We Do It Better. And uh, I think when we talk about that, that spirit of togetherness, uh, you take a look at the IA, uh, SMACNA, and the NTF, I think the three groups together have really, you know, have shown, shown that, that uh, spirit. SMACNA has, in the last uh, four or five years, uh, shown that we'd like to work closer together, not have an adversarial arrangement. And this exhibit, demonstrates how well working together accomplishes a lot of things. California. January 25th, 1988, the 100th Europe. anniversary of the Sheet Metal Workers International Association. The At the Building Museum that day, General President Carlo officially dedicated the Sheet Metal Monument, calling it an unfinished symphony. That afternoon, Florence Carlo unveiled the permanent Edward F. Carlo Gallery in honor of her late husband. taking place in the museum, but the Sheet Metal Workers International Association... AFL-CIO President There's Lane no Kirkland said, though the celebration is happening in a museum, I'm this union, with its skill and its leadership, is no museum piece. And to open the exhibit, the sheet metal ribbon was cut with shears over 100 years old. Back over there, please, Those who went inside the structure that day were the first to see a display of craftsmanship, pride, versatility, and heart. Crafted from sheet copper in 1912, this lion's head decorated the facade of a public school in New York City. Built in the early 19th century, this ornament was applied to a sheet iron stove. Downspouts have been a sheet metal specialty from centuries past to present day. Stretching the metal with a shaping hammer from above and a yielding surface below created this Indian head, circa 1920. Today's sheet metal takes on many forms, from a modern palm tree to the famous ball that drops every New Year's Eve in Times Square. Visitors can also see a fully equipped sheet metal shop which is part of the exhibit. On weekends, apprentices demonstrate techniques and tools of today and of past centuries. The 1893 double truss wood break was innovative in the shaping of cornices. Other tools on display at the exhibit include this 1848 beading machine used for putting raised impressions on sheet metal and this crimping machine from 1922 a hand crank drill press from 1914, 
and roofing tongs from 1880. And so they celebrated 100 years. We have many great unions and great individuals in the building trades. But the sheet metal workers take a back seat to no one, to no group, when it comes to skilled craftsmen and trade union principles. And they celebrated the, as yet, unfinished symphony. But on the 10th of March, they would pen the final note of this symphony. All who took part in this creation would sign the last piece of sheet metal before it would be put into place. And so, the sheet metal tower was complete. Once again, sheet metal workers had met the challenge. Their spirit of cooperation with one another and with the contractors who provided the metal which they bent and shaped was the soul of this endeavor. But its heart was the hard-won skill of these men and women. And as people come to see this in the months ahead, perhaps they'll catch a glimmer of that pride which holds it together. The building is gorgeous, and this thing is really a work of art. Whoever designed it has really got to be a genius. I'd like to bring my kids down here and my husband and, and show them that I had a part in it. you got to have a lot of pride to come up here and work on this thing, and it's, uh, it's probably the, the peak of my career. I feel good about it. My father was a sheet metal worker, and it's all it's been in the family. Uh, the trade has been in the family a long time. Uh, it's, yes, I can't say how it makes me feel. It's, it's kind of touching. I would keep this for a lifetime. Because it's going to be something very nice to look at, and I'm sure that it's going to impress a lot of people. And that there's a lot of people that don't know what a sheet metal worker is. Well, they can see what we can produce in making this piece of art. Craftsmanship, skill, pride, the hallmark of excellence that is the Union Sheet Metal Worker. <laughs>